Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this good day you have given to us. We thank you for your love and your care for us, for giving us the opportunity to worship and glorify you, to enjoy the fellowship of one another. We thank you, Father, for a day to put away our cares and our concerns and to delight in the grace that abounds to us in Jesus Christ. And we thank you now that here at the end of the day we can once more come and consider the wonders you have done and the glory which you possess. And we pray, Father, tonight that you would sharpen our minds, that we might think the thoughts after you are right, that you would indeed discipline our hearts, that we would love and feel as we ought, that you would train our words and our steps, that we might speak and act before you in a godly and righteous manner. Have mercy on us this night, O God, that we might be sanctified by your teaching and by the time we have discussing one with another the matters before us. Have mercy, Father, that we would be blessed richly tonight and encouraged to delight in you more and to spend this week in the praise of your name. For it is in that name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we are on lecture number 10 of the relationship study. And I'm doing uh, something of an intermission here, but with good reason for framing. So we've been going through the Ten Commandments. Commandments 1, 2, 3, and 4 are generally considered vertical commandments, the first table of the laws, it's called. They're commandments that pertain to our relationship with God. And we've looked a little bit at those commandments and how they sort of impact and shape our relationship with one another. That we need to have no other gods before him in our relationship. Otherwise, we'll end up making gods of ourselves or of others. So the way we keep from idolizing or deifying ourselves and others is we make God God in that relationship. To maintain his priority in the relationship, we need to worship him. We need to keep his name holy and we need to keep his day holy. And in Fulfilling those four commandments, we discipline our relationships to keep God as God in those relationships. Now we're going to transition to the second table of the law, commandments 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And we'll look at things like parenting and marriage, and we'll look at things like friendship. We'll look at things like discipleship and mentoring. We'll look at the relationships that grow out of those commandments, work and vocation. But before we get into that, there is this sort of category I think we should deal with as sort of an intermission. And hopefully you'll see why I wanted to deal with that here between the two commandments. First, um, when we get into this subject, I want to establish in our culture this idea that singleness ultimately, as it is expressed frequently in our culture, is a myth. There's a myth to it. Um, John Donne is the, the famous poet, once observed, no man is an island entire to himself. Rather, every man is a piece of a continent, a part of the main, a clod washed away by the sea, and Europe would be less. As well as a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or thine own were, as man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, the famous line, Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. For it tolls for thee. There is an integrated nature to humanity. That something John Donne lighted upon is that we are not islands. Ultimately, there's no such thing as a single person. All humans live in community. That's the premise. That's the framework for the commandments 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 is that we are humans who cannot escape human relationships. We are humans who must of necessity be in relationship and covenant one with another. Defining singleness in this way is kind of like defining cold or dark. All you're trying to describe is the absence of something. But within our culture, we're describing the absence of something very narrow and specific. The myth that I'm talking about here is the idea that unwed people are alone. And this is the distinction that I want us to make in our language. Within our relationships, we can speak of human beings being married and not married. But we must be careful that we do not speak of people 
as being alone or single, unless they truly are. And unless we are acknowledged that that is a default, is a faulty state of being. For humans are called to covenant and to community, of which marriage is one expression, but not the only one. There is also church covenant. There is also friendship communities and co-laboring. There is a myriad of relationships that we should not denigrate by simply labeling humans as alone in their space. The human self in space is not alone. There is an inescapable divinity, Psalm 139, selection B. All humans have a relationship with God. It might not be a very good one. It might be a very dangerous one. It might be one in which God is very angry and going to bring that human into judgment soon. But it is a relationship nonetheless. The human is not truly alone or single in that sense. Likewise, as we've discussed earlier, the human is in a relationship with the creation. As embodied beings, um, I spoke with uh, Dan, not Dan, Angelina's husband. Ben. ben, thank you. Yeah, my brain is like trying to get on board here. Yeah, so I spoke with Ben this morning. We had a great conversation about this idea. We are embodied beings. And so love for another human being necessarily has a physical component. You love someone, you feed them. You love someone, you give them drink. You give them clothing. You give them shelter. You show care for their physical body because we cannot escape our relationship to the physical. We cannot escape a relationship with the world and the creation. Likewise, we show love in handshakes, hugs, physical contact. We are necessarily bodied beings and we cannot escape it. And if you live in a place like Boston, you realize very quickly that if you ride the T at 5 p.m., we are embodied beings and we cannot escape being in each other's space. It's just crowded. We live in a world and we cannot escape other humans or other creations. Christians have another added layer. Not only is there an inevitability to relationships, not as only is there a necessity to community, but Christians have an obligation and an expectation. We who are being fashioned as a church and as individuals after a triune God, God himself is in community. He is for all eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not alone. He's not single. He is three in one. And so humanity likewise exists in this one and the many dynamic in this tension of always seeking and achieving community. The church is called to that ethical standard, to live in friendship, to live in fellowship, to live in community. I want us to consider six different points in the scriptures very briefly. What I'm kind of tongue-in-cheek calling the biblical basis for not being antisocial. <laughs> Working backward. The metaphor for heaven in the book of Revelation is a city. And as I just illustrated with the going to the T at 5 p.m. on a weekday, what happens in a city? Why are cities so special? Has anyone read Edward Glasser's The Triumph of the City? It was on my reading list when I accepted the call. Did I told you guys, right? Daniel Howe gave me a reading list. It was on the list, so I read it. The real thing that you should get after Daniel about is he gave me a reading list he himself had not finished. So now I've completed books that he hasn't read. But anyway, so having read this Edward Glasser's book, Triumph of the City, what is so profound about a city? What is so successful about a city that, what is the percentage? A very high percentage of human beings live in cities. What is it? 50%. Globally. Yeah. Okay. Oh, in the U.S. Terrific. Half of all humanity lives in a city. Why? What does a city have to offer? Relationships. Interworking. Interplay. We are brought into proximity and we actually have to work with each other. And we actually have to relate and rely upon each other. Heaven has, as a metaphor, a city. The idea of close proximity and deep, intimate relationships. 
It's held out as a vision of heaven. What is more, the church has as a metaphor a house. And what's the first thing you learn about sharing a house with another human being? Space leads to sin. Having to share space leads to sin. And yet, the vision of the church is that we would be as a family, occupying a singular house, invading one another's space. The vision for both heaven and the church is that we would be in relationship, in community, that we would occupy and even to a degree violate each other's space. I mean that in a good way. I mean that in a healthy, constructive, loving, not ignoring each other way. But also notice that God throughout the scriptures has revealed his intentions, that he longs for a kingdom and a nation. The church for a time was established as a political entity. And while God has done away with having the church limited to a political entity, that is only because he has expanded the kingdom to all politics everywhere. God has not lost his political interest. He has just claimed all political powers everywhere. He has magnified the claim that God wishes to have a nation, a nation of every tribe, tongue, and nation. There are political, economic, and social consequences to our faith. For a long time in the 20th century, Christianity, particularly evangelicalism, became dominated by the idea of a private faith. And it was the RPCNA, particularly J.G. Voss, who took a very hard stand against that. In fact, his doctoral dissertation, which is on one of our shelves somewhere, The Scottish Covenanters, has a forward in which he addresses this issue. The importance of this tradition and of the stories of the Covenanters is they rejected the private faith and said Christianity is a public faith. Christianity is a faith that testifies to economics, that teaches governments, that demands all human relationships everywhere come under the headship of Jesus Christ. In fact, you all who are communicant members of this congregation have made that promise to bring every relationship to the service of the king and his kingdom. Likewise, God wants a family. He wants a kingdom. There are political, economic, and social consequences. He wants a family. He wants us to operate as siblings. Repeatedly, particularly through the Apostle Paul, we have the doctrine of adoption and the teachings and the requirements that we love one another as brothers and sisters. There is a community dynamic that is expected of us in our faith. And then lastly, going back to the very beginning... There is the theological underpinning that a vision of heaven is community, that an understanding of the church is community, that God's goal for the world is community, but also that God himself expressed in community. As I mentioned, God is Trinity. He is three in one. He dwells eternally in community, but also notice that Jesus is Emmanuel. It is God's intention that he be part of the community. God desires us to live in relationship with him and one another. And he sees no great divergence between the vertical bonds and the horizontal bonds. The expectation is that we would not be alone. In fact, this brings us back to the very beginning in which God created the heavens and the earth. And at the end of the first day, he said, sky, water, light, dark, dry land, ocean, birds, fish, animals. It is good. It is good. It is good. And then he made Adam and he said, it is very good. And then what did he say? It is not good for man to be alone. We were created for community, not to be alone, but to be in community and fellowship one with another. This is why the next six commandments emerge to guide human communities 
in all their different expressions, unique and specific. But let's not rush to them without first framing the commands in this broad view. As Christians, as humans, we were made to live in community. Any questions on that thought, that section? All right, I want to push back now and create a little balance. There was a great tradition throughout the medieval ages of teaching two opposite sides and then leave them unresolved in the audience's mind. I won't do that. Um, there is a, a book, um, Sik et Non, Yes and No. It, was, it, it purported to be all the places in the Christian faith in which the correct answer is yes and no. And so there is this, this tension and this understanding. To a degree, there is a myth of singleness. No human should be single. We are not alone in the world. We are meant for community. But there is also an importance of singleness. There is a value and a significance for us that we must not overlook. There is three things in particular that I want to highlight that shows us the importance of singular, uh, of single. I'm equivocating on my word. By single, I now mean unwed. If it's easier for everybody, I can just try and use that word. So humans who are not married. Number one, the importance to a human community that we have those in it who are not wed is that it communicates to us that we are first humans and not functions. It is all too easy and quite understandable for us to become sucked into our performances, particularly in something as universal and demanding as marriage and parenting, that we actually begin to forget we're humans first. You know that great moment when you tell your kids that you played soccer in high school, in college, and they go, you did what? It's like, I didn't do that. It's, Tim did that. Lydia did that. I didn't play soccer um, ever. But there is this understanding that your kids are like, wait, you, you were born when I was born. You came into existence when I came into existence. Children have this, this struggle to imagine your world before them. But we have the same issues in our marriages, don't we, not? What, was, what were you like before I was there? What happened there? Lynn and I have this fascinating dynamic where our relationship goes back to when we were 14. There's not much memory before that. <laughs> you know? But there is an understanding that we are humans. There is a self. And the reason this is important, particularly for Christians, is the doctrine of union of, with Christ. That within the church, we need to remember and recover the concept that we are about the business of producing disciples, not spouses. That comes later. Our goal is to produce lovers of Jesus. If something emerges otherwise, lovers of one another, that's wonderful. And you have to have that. You have to have marriage and children for there to be a church in 50 years. All of us are going to die, you know, so we need kids to take our place. Nevertheless, we must not lose the sight of the fact that we are humans and our sexuality is not our soul. Our marriage is not our heaven and our singleness is not hell, Jackie Hill Perry. But rather the church has as its vision to make followers of Christ, to bring and to embrace a faith in Jesus Christ that may be expressed in marriage and in parenting in a normal sort of way. That's a common phenomenon. But we should not treat normal as normative in this sense, but recover the idea that identity is not found in office, but in union with Christ. To say I am a husband is to speak in secondary terms. To say I am a son of God is to speak in primary terms. Identity is to be found in faith in Jesus Christ, which is shared regardless of gender and sexual status. There is this identity that is rooted in Jesus first and preeminently. But secondly, not only do we have the union with Christ, our, our humanity, 
that is brought to the fore, we also have the importance of the church as a fellowship, as a body, as the community to which we're called. In the first section, I wanted to establish the principle that we are called to community. But we're not just called to community in a generic sense. We're called to a particular community, to the church. It is God's ambition that the human species would become coterminous with the kingdom. That is what he is aiming for. The eradication of evil and evildoers. The fulfillment and the full population of godliness. When we see in the cultural mandate, be fruitful and multiply, have lots of kiddos, we must also read it in the lens of Malachi. What is God after? Godly offspring. He delights in seeing his humanity flourish as believers, as faith. Kevin DeYoung said it this way, family is good, necessary, and fundamental. It is not ultimate. Family is a necessary good and fundamental component of human society. Economies cannot survive without marriage. America is proving that at present. Economies cannot survive. Political orders and civic societies cannot endure without families. They are a fundamental, essential, necessary building block. But they are not the end either. They are the foundation and upon them they must be built. Relationships and communities extend out from families. Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, that childness may be due to nature or employment. That's putting it mildly. It's more slavery is what he says. Or voluntary service to the kingdom. That there is an understanding that with... Those who are unwed or childless within the church are bringing yet to our perspective the preeminence of that church community and the importance of living in this friendship and fellowship of the believers in Jesus Christ. Paul himself is the leading example of this third category. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I wish that all men were even as myself. By this, Paul does not insult marriage. That's clear from the rest of the chapter. But rather, Paul is emphasizing the significance of singleness, to borrow the title from Christina Hitchcock's book, the significance of singleness that bears on us is the preeminence of the church community. To make this connection a little stronger, to bear out its theology in a little more prominent way, We should come then to the third idea. That those who are living among us without marriage or children remind us of the reality of the resurrection. One day we will all be unwed. For we shall be wed to Christ. Only one marriage survives death. Christ and his church. The preeminence of the church community is most manifest and visible in the reality of the resurrection. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus taught, there is no marriage or giving in marriage in heaven. There is, for the lack of a better word, says Christina Hitchcock, the worldliness of marriage will pass away. There is the reality of our bonds and our mutual love, but our relationship as brothers and sisters will become preeminent in heaven. There is a celibate humanity that is awaiting. There is a sanctified singleness to which we are called, if by that we mean unwed. There is a preeminence of our union with Christ, expressed in our communion with fellow siblings, which the resurrection itself makes true, real, and final. There is an importance, beloved. Single people, by that I mean unwed, not alone, are important to our community. They are not merely marriage partners in waiting. They are not merely future parents. They are living in active theological reminders of the friendship and fellowship 
that is preeminent in the human experience of salvation. The future, in fact, that all of us are looking for and awaiting. Any thoughts or questions on that? Yeah, Tom. It's not an idea that we hear very much. Right. <laughs> One interest that I had in sort of taking this intermission and addressing this issue was the reality that in reading this myriad of books, I, I promise I will give you a bibliography, <laughs> on relationships that I read, it was stunning how many books on relationships had nothing on the relationships that weren't somehow filtered in marriage, parenting, etc. Until I went and looked for books that were on singleness. And let me tell you, the list is not long. <laughs> so it's not a common familiar topic. I think there's maybe a couple reasons for it. One, one is the normative nature of it. Most human beings get married and have kids. That's a normal human thing. That's a good thing. Like if we want more humans, then marriage and parenting is gonna have to happen. That's the way we get more humans. Because this generation won't live forever, we're gonna need younger humans to grow up and take our place. And they'll need to have younger humans to grow up and take our place. That's, that's the nature of it. And so I think because that's such, such a normal experience, this gets overlooked. I think the other thing is, is and, and I certainly felt this reading about it, putting together, okay, well, how am I gonna say this? What am I gonna say? And then saying it now. I, I think there's some, some great timidity and some great fear of facing this reality and, and acknowledging this is part of the dynamic. Um, and what I find struggling, fascinating about that sense of fear of like facing singleness and actually giving it its theological place in the church is the idea that church history is strewn with people from, you know, the Apostle Paul on who were dedicated to the friendship and fellowship of the church as their preeminent source of relationship. Yes. Can you comment on um, the syllabus given on the Catholic Church and how that affects this whole topic? I'm wondering if the fact that the Reformation is speaking against that as a requirement made them sort of not want to talk about it as being in any way positive. Interesting, <laughs> yeah. I hadn't thought about that coming, coming into this study. Um, that's a really, really good insight. I, I would be curious to know if anyone has done some historical research in sort of that movement. Um, the factual statements are certainly there that the Reformation rightly opposed vows of celibacy and the impositions of celibacy upon the clergy, thankfully. Um, <laughs> I do think that um, that could have produced then a perhaps multi-year gener you know, uh, generation. Th this was one phrase that was used in one of the books. Protestant evangelicals do not label marriage a sacrament, but we sometimes treat it like it is. And so that was just an interesting insight of perhaps there's a degree to which we've come full circle in having rejected marriage as a sacrament. We've nevertheless embraced it and elevated it to a degree that it's you know, now become one again in function, perhaps. I really don't know about the history. It's a good question. By the way, next week is on marriage. <laughs> or I'm sorry, parenting, parenting. Sure. What's the line for making sure that, like, do you make sure that people are in community? And is it wrong for people to go away from community for long stretches of time? Um, I, 
as a historian, I'm a little, you know, as a history-minded person, not a historian, um, I, I, I'm a little intrigued to like jump on that and be like, I would have discouraged Americans from going into the West and like, you know, pillaging the natural resources for lots of reasons <laughs> other than their loneliness. Um, but, but I think it is true that uh, to make a long story short, you sort of see the Wild West culture and you sort of see that in a greater and lesser degree until they start shipping women west, life's not good. And the life expectancy out there was not good. And there was an enormous amount of crime and violence. And yeah, like women and children tend to domesticate wild beasts and husbands. Um, there's, there's this uh, significance, I think, to not getting out of the community um, it's interesting, so maybe to go, to go to a historical reference a little more accessible to me right now. So St. Anthony embraces a monasticism of oneness. And it's really fascinating because as Athanasius records his story, he ends up rejecting that and going into communal monasticism. Um, and... Athanasius doesn't really develop sort of his logic, but you can sort of see within what St. Anthony tries to do with his community that he seemed to come to the conclusion his faith could not flourish in isolation. It needed other brothers and sisters and friendships. And so I think, yes, with the American frontier, we're reading through the Laura Ingalls Wilder series, you know, as a family, part of their, their schooling, and the realization that it's not explicitly stated, but they weren't a churched family because they were generally on the frontier where there weren't churches, where there weren't pastors. And, and there's something sort of, I don't know, you know how you read that series as a kid and it's like really cool and you read it as an adult and you're like, whoa, this was bad. <laughs> Why did they do that? There is this isolation, I think, that is dangerous. Uh, David Hackett Fisher's book, Albion Seed, you know, he talks about records of the Pennsylvania Dutch moving into the Midwest out of Pennsylvania through the Appalachians. And they would come upon these just filthy Scots-Irish hovels where the dude had gone off hunting last fall and he hadn't come back yet. And if you've ever read the stories of Davy Crockett, like the guy was gone for two years at a stretch and just abandoned his family. Um, there, there is throughout the settling of the American frontier, I think, a significant amount of dangerous examples of how humanity doesn't do well, breaking away from institutions and structures that are meant for human thriving. Don't take it too far. We do need space. We do. Yes. I have a, a lecture coming up uh, on poverty and Corbett and Fickert's book, uh, When Helping Hurts, they make the point that's often been made in other, in other contexts and situations. How would you define poverty? They can tell you what your income level is based on your answer. Your middle class or upper middle class when you say it's a lack of resources. Because you know what the poor say? Lack of relationships lack of respect, lack of friends. Yeah, they, I think it's true within the single mom culture, within the, within the poverty culture, within the abortion experience. A lot of it is coming down to, I don't have a community. I don't have a fellowship, a family. By family, I mean expansive, not nuclear. Yes. Singleness. I, 
you know, intuitively I'm thinking in my mind, someone who's in their kind of early 20s, post-college, getting on their feet, and, you know, life is moving along. We were all single at some point. We were all single at some point, exactly. <laughs> Meaning and, unwed. <laughs> and so I'm also, you know, having in mind the stat that, you know, youth are, you know, dropping and like leaving the church, especially in college. Um, is there something that we're missing, not we as FRCC, but it, is the church missing something about community in terms of how it relates to youth and, you know, for what you're Yeah, great question. Um, I would say that the main thing I want to communicate in, the, in this lecture, the main thing I want grasped is that idea of we as a church need to embrace community as the goal, as the mission, and to give community to those who are outside, to bring them into the community, as well as to see the significance of community, and to recognize that those who are among us without spouse or child necessarily communicate that that at the end of the day is what the church is about, is that friendship and that community. Um, not just a collection of families who are trying to raise their kids together. Um, I would say that one thing in particular that that vision of community will bring out is a multi-generational nature. One of my big concerns or critiques about youth ministries I've both experienced or participated in in the past is reducing youth to a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. My strongest and most meaningful bonds as a youth were with all the 70, 80 year olds who adopted me and took me seriously when I was a wet behind the ears, worthless kid who was like, oh, I wanna be a pastor and had like the most impious and wicked reasons why. And all the elders in my church and my pastor and my dad took me seriously and adopted me and said, hey, here's a book. Hey, let me take you to a conference. Hey, let's sit and talk about theology. Hey, let's talk, sit and talk about your sins. And there was a multi-generational thing. It wasn't my peers that pushed me. It was my elders. And that multi-generational community, I think, is largely what we've been drawing away from and what we need to get back, you know, is, is to restore that. Mm. Um, and I was part of Campus Crusade in college, and I was in the vast minority of someone who thought that it was important to go to church every week. And yeah. a lot of people thought that, well, if I go to my youth ministry or like my college ministry thing, then that's like my church. Um, sort of like just like a theological framework, I think is not as strong. Sure. Yeah, very good. That's a, that's a good insight. Tom. Well, this is kind of making me think of, uh, uh, I can't remember which movie. It's somebody coming about this, uh, when he was speaking of membership class, made the comment that there's a great desire in our culture for community, but we want community without credit. Yes. And so we sell community as this thing that gives you stuff, but not as this thing that you partake in and, and contribute to and, and give something always sell to something that's only giving you stuff when you don't get what you want then you leave right you disengage yeah I, I one of the other books I'm using for this this lecture was Christine Prohl's uh, living into community uh, about hospitality and community and I, I have uh, the quote here is we want to be connected without being encumbered we want community on our terms meaning brief occasional and intense yeah we we want Absorption. Uh, what am I getting out of it? Bobby Jamison. Bobby Jamison, yeah. And community, in a Christian sense, demands of us. Yeah. Yes, Chris. Uh, on the history of our, our presbytery, it shows that part of it, it's part of the course, but the, the refinement was for many years. It was not unrelated to Western Union. Yeah. Boston, two big congregations, 
Catholic foundations in Boston. Um, um, this, I, I, there are many, many of these up in the Western room of Chicago anymore, but there, it was significant in the, in the, uh, the dying, the dying side of the church. We, we like to think ourselves immune from the great forces of history, but we are not. Yeah, very good. Okay. Ready for the last section? Uh, number letter C. Let's go back up to the top. I'm out of room here. Letter C, the importance of community. What I want to shift to now is what I've done in the last couple of lectures is, is sort of move into some practical considerations. Again, I, as I mentioned just a moment ago, leaning a bit on Christine Pohl's book, uh, Living Into Community. Um, community's value, not surprisingly like singleness, communicates something significant about the kingdom and about our humanity. First, about the kingdom. Living in community is the best testimony to the truth of the gospel, and it's our quality of life together. There is something profound and radical, something persuasive and compelling about humans actually loving each other and enjoying each other. I was reflecting with uh, Tim and with Tom, Tim and Tom, I gestured backward, <laughs> Uh, this last week about the uh, congregational retreat that I was the guest speaker at down in D.C. on the Chesapeake. And uh, they had a night that was a competitive skit night. I, I'd love to tell you the story, but I'm out of time. Um, so it was a competitive skit night. They have the church there, and they're all using props, and they're all having these competitive skits, and it's all very funny. And someone made the observation when it was over. You know, there's really something about just getting your church together and laughing for three or four hours. And there really is, isn't there? There's something about getting together and just, you know, Denny Pruto would stalk through the seminary and we would be, usually Shane Sapp, would be telling stories and jokes and everybody would be laughing. And Denny Pruto would come stomping in and he'd go, you Christians are having too much fun. And then he'd walk out laughing his head off. He thought it was funny. There is something to an authentic friendship, to a vibrant affection for one another. I love these people. Psalm 16, the joy and delight of my heart are your saints on earth. I love the people of God. They are my joy and my delight. This is a testimony to the kingdom power. It is a beautiful, powerful, poignant testimony to the kingdom power. You know why? You ready for the bad news? Because we're not easy people to love. Because we are selfish and sinful people. And if a church genuinely loves each other and lives lives together and draws into this deep, affectionate, meaningful community, it is a marvelous testimony to the world who says, so why are you so incredibly different from the rest of us who can't get along? And we say, we're not. We just have Jesus. And it becomes this witness to the kingdom. Secondly, to humanity. There's a tragic reality to America. Personal freedom and self-fulfillment. I think I've blasted Thomas Jefferson on this before. Changing the third article from property to the pursuit of happiness was an epic mistake. And the pursuit of happiness, personal freedom, self-fulfillment has left us a lonely, fragile people. Self-seeking is self-destructive. Living for the ambitions of the person will only destroy the human. We were built to sacrifice designed to give and to share and to love, and we thrive in those moments. I think I've testified to this before as well. There's nothing like going to an old folks home and visiting with elderly people and walking away going, I got way more out of that than they did. I know I did. There's something rich about love and proximity and fellowship, something joyful, good, and pleasant, to quote from Psalm 133, which we'll sing in a minute. 
that there is something good and pleasant about being in close proximity to one another. Our humanity comes into its flower and flourishes. We become fully human. We do not become human on our own. Humanity is expressed in humanity and love one for another. A fullness of the image of God is necessarily communal. So to do this then, we will need practices. And I'm going to have to go back up to the top. So this is under practices. I'm, I'm going to list off the practices. Again, borrowing, taking these from Christina Pohl. One, keep promises. I would add to that, make them. Human relationships require commitment. They require promises. Promises are critically important because all human relationships are going to thrive and die on expectations, unmet or unfulfilled. Promises establish expectations up front. Here's what I've given you. Here's what I've offered you. Here's what we're aiming to do. Here's our priority. We may often lose sight of them and have our expectations arise unbeknownst to us and others, but promises become a ballast to establish commitment and to shape us to them. They are essential for healthy human communities. Secondly, tell the truth. There is nothing like a pious, well-meaning silence to destroy the peace and well-being of brothers and sisters who have badly hurt each other and don't know it or aren't willing to face it. We must share our faults in humility, confess them freely, and we must be willing to gently poke others and say with love and with kindness, you hurt me, you offended me. We must be able to tell the truth to one another. We must make and keep promises. We must tell the truth and we must give gratitude. Human communities cannot exist without mutual appreciation. The disparity of affection will necessarily drive us apart. There must be an expression of thanks actually speaking one to another. I appreciate you. I appreciate the work you do. I appreciate your contribution. I see it. I notice it. It is not forgotten or overlooked. But likewise, I like using this verb when we speak of gratitude and thanks. One, it's alliterative, give gratitude. But two, in the Hebrew, give thanks is literally give. You know how we in the West will hand someone a present and you know what we'll say? This is to say thanks. It's funny to me. It's exactly opposite the Hebrew culture. If you went to someone in Hebrew and say, I would like to say thank you, they would hold out their hands and say, where is it? Because to them, thanks is something concrete and tangible. Thanks is something you hold, not something you say. Thanksgiving is something you give. You pass one to another. We must remember this in our gratitude. In our culture, a verbal expression of gratitude is a good one. Use it, practice it, become comfortable with it. But it's also good to go a little farther and actually show gratitude in action, in deed, in, in true tangible ways. Another, you know, one small little one, when you say thank you to someone, put your hand on his or her shoulder. Give thanks in personal touch, drawing near. Not always appropriate, but sometimes a nice thing. Sometimes it's better to use a gift. Be sincere, be frequent, actually have some affection and gratitude for one another and see their value, their contribution to the community. Lastly, offer hospitality. Open your home, open your kitchen, open your heart. Our world was meant to be shared until the fridge is open and the table is set until the calendar is cleared. I've actually heard from one member of the church twice now in the last two weeks. He remembers very affectionately sitting down and talking with an elder and saying, okay, well, uh, how much time do you have? And the elder said, as much as you need. And he just burst into tears. Are our calendars open? 
Are our hearts and lives open? Do we actually say, come, invade my space? It's your space too. We're here in this world together. We're here in this community together. We will share our lives. We will open them up one to another. We will live in each other's space and dwell in this fellowship. Now, there are two caveats I want to add to this. So I'm going to add them to the list, but this is, is caveats. Discernment. The last one is forgiveness. To sustain these four practices, these four rituals, habits of healthy community, to make promises and keep them one to another, to tell the truth one to another, to express gratitude and to give hospitality, to sustain these, we will need discernment and forgiveness. By discernment, we mean enforcing the boundaries. In order for the community to survive, we must draw and enforce boundaries. There must be things that are unacceptable to the community. Otherwise, it's no longer a community. In order to define a group of people, there has to be something that's in it and something that's out of it. There must be boundaries. This is simply discipline. This is an essential feature of discipline. How many of you grew up hearing the words, we don't do that? How many of you as parents say, we don't do that. There is a community sense to the ethic. You are in the boundary of this community and therefore you cannot live like that. That belongs outside this community. There must be a discipline within the church community in order to preserve the church community. If we do not have lines in the sand that people cannot cross, if we do not have discernment and say, this is part of the community, that is not part of the community. The community cannot survive. It has to have limits. But secondly, it must have forgiveness. And this, by contrast, is not boundary set, but center set. Forgiveness is drawing us inward to the center, back to the supremacy of God, the supremacy of Christ in our relationships. It is the releasing of wrongs and the reconciling one to another simply on the grounds that Christ has come between us and that Christ has brought us together. Paul teaches that the, the ministry of reconciliation rests on the fact that Christ is a reconciler. The community comes inward to the center by the drawing power of the love of Jesus Christ forgiving those offenses and wrongs that destroy and damage the community. But we must also practice discernment and discipline, setting the boundaries. So in these ways, these two ways, we provide some framework and limits for this otherwise positive effort toward promises, truth, gratitude, and hospitality. Let me sum it up this way. The importance of community, to quote Wesley Hill, you cannot die to yourself by yourself. So it's in Comet Magazine. We are called to self-crucifixion. We are called to self-denial. And you cannot die to yourself by yourself. To give up yourself is to give up yourself in service to others. We must live in community. I know I've used this quote before, but also then to end, to give C.S. Lewis the last word. There is no safe investment. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will certainly be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure that your heart is intact, you must give it to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it up in carefully with hobbies, little luxuries, avoid all entanglements, lock it up in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside of heaven 
where you are perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. We need community. We need friendship. We need true fellowship. We were built to live together as brothers and sisters in this grand family of God. And we cannot fulfill the commands to die to ourselves by ourselves. Questions or comments on that section? Yes, Jake. You were speaking earlier about the dangers of the pursuit of personal happiness and ambition. So would you say that someone who suffers from feelings of unfulfillment and sacrifice too little? Potentially. I would be careful with a blanket statement. Sure, naturally, yeah. Yeah, but I, I do think there is a tendency that feeling unfulfilled is often a symptom of being short on sacrifice, commitment, devotion. Um, the, the studies that have been done, the re human relationships that people find most satisfying, the preeminent relationship, parenting. It's the single most expensive one. <laughs> it costs you everything you have. And there is that sense of self-sacrifice. I think that that study was done in America and therefore is skewed by our lack of sense of community. If you look into the ancient culture, in ancient Greece, ancient Near East, the preeminent relationship that mattered most to everybody was your friends. It's actually fascinating to look through the ancient culture and its preeminence on friendship. Now, they had issues. They saw marriage as purely, you know, a way to have babies. And they saw babies as purely future heirs. They, they didn't invest in their families as a source of affection necessarily. However, I think they have something on friendship that we need. Yes, Tim. Yes. And I think um, something that hurts our community and the potential for growth in community is just this idea of like wanting to appear that we kind of have everything together. So you, you strike up a conversation, how's work going? How, how's your family going? And it's just very tempting to say, yeah, it's going pretty well. You know, like I have it together. And what really helps our community is when we say, I'm actually really struggling at work right now with yeah. this. Or, I'm having a hard time parenting or whatever. And, and those are the times where I feel like there's opportunities to sort of take our community deeper and really help each other. And it's just very tempting in our culture to just be like, yeah, I'll keep my problems to myself. I'll work on them and keep other people out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great insight. If you want uh, a little more on cultivating vulnerability and intimacy, I can recommend a class that happens at 9... 45 in this room um, <laughs> every Sabbath morning. So Tom has been teaching. Yeah. <laughs> Which we appreciate. <laughs> That's an important relationship too. <laughs> no, no. It's Very good. So Ed Welsh wrote a, a little book, uh, Eight Ways to Care for One Another. And uh, what? That, wait, eight ways. To Care for One Another, To Care for Each Other by Ed Welsh. And uh, it, it's a book I used in preparing some of these lectures. And uh, Tom had also seen it and thought it was good. So we put our heads together and said, let's have a Sabbath school class on it so that there could be a complement to this lecture series that's a little more hands-on and a little more uh, almost workshop-like where we break into small groups and we actually do some of the whole like, all right, there's only four or five of you, so you should feel a little safer now. Open up. Why do you not share your life with others? What are some of your barriers and boundaries? What are you struggling with this week? Okay, pray for each other now. 
So I, I don't know about you guys' small group, but the August small group um, has been... Uh, <laughs> We're, we're, we're separated by birthdays, and there happens to be a large number of August birthdays in this congregation. So we get to spend a lot of time together, and we're really getting to know each other. And uh, it's great. So uh, us August birthdays. Just have a recommend. Advertise that multiply through the bulletin, through the pulpit, through, you know, that this is happening because... We need to be, you know, people that aren't there need to come. People need to know that. I don't even know what's happening. I think I sort of know the no, but I don't. So, yeah. I mean, it's a good class. It's yeah. a very good class. Yeah. Grow in our intimacy to one another. And particularly, I think if we want to build vulnerability and intimacy with others, we should start with ourselves. Humility should lead. Start with confessing our own sin, seeking help. That's actually the first chapter of Ed Welsh's book. The first thing you need to know about helping others is you need help. Now you're ready to help others. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes, Carol. Yeah, very good. Yeah, like Tim's point about tell the truth, it's just as important to receive hospitality as it is to give hospitality. There is really great bonding that comes when you humble yourself and receive the kindness and welcome of others. I also think uh, you're, you're very much right about the creativity. So when, when I was in Beaver Falls, I took up golfing. I don't golf. I was terrible at golf. But it was like the one thing that this like group of guys that no one in the church could ever get time with would do every Saturday morning for hours. And it's like, okay, I will golf and we will have time together. You know, and thankfully I found cycling and, you know, we do that now. <laughs> but you're absolutely correct about the creativity and the flexibility of hospitality means being together. And if that's at the library or a walk around the street, sure, wherever it takes place. Yeah. Tom. Maybe just following up on the comment about hospitality. Offering hospitality sometimes just have to be baby steps. I yeah. remember being a single man just going to graduate student and, and receiving a lot of hospitality being like, I should do hospitality, but I can't meet like the level of what these people are doing. So I kind of like asked two people that I knew pretty well, which was Jack Nellis. It's like, come over and I'll show you hospitality and you don't expect too much. <laughs> it's like their practice. Dinner soup, right? I was, I was going to ask, do you remember this house? <laughs> Excellent. I just have to say, Tom's comments seems incredibly ironic. <laughs> I, I think it is a great insight where it's like start small, baby steps are always the way we begin. You know, yeah, d don't expect to be the elite hospitaler that you see in your congregation. They weren't either at one time. They grew into that. You know, it's a skill to develop into home. Okay. Well, thank you. We're 10 minutes over. So let's uh, go to Psalm 133, Selection uh, B. Psalm 133, Selection B. And then uh, before that, I will close this in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you have dwelt in fellowship and community for all eternity. And that you have invited us to share in the blessings and the joy of living one with another 
to recognize that love and freedom and peace come when we dwell with one another with self-sacrificial care and kindness. And our Father, we pray that you would forgive us for the selfishness that rears up so violently within us. And pray, Father, that you would instead give us joy in our service to each other and our delight in being with one another and near each other. I thank you, Father, that you desired to be with us and have come near to us. And that we can bless your name this night, knowing that you will one day lift us nearer still and we will be in your presence face to face as with a friend in the heavenly realms. Father, bless us tonight as we go our way. Give us deep, peaceful sleep and let us begin this week refreshed and energized to serve you in this place. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.